safe on Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's going to grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm James Hi. Wesley. I'm Seth Rudesky, and this is Stars in the House. That's right. It's our daily live stream fundraiser talk series for the Actors Fund. Right. Now, the Actors Fund, if you don't know, is specifically only for Broadway actors <laughs> to get <laughs> basically backyard pools. Oh, uh, that's not what true. What is the Actors Fund? Well, actually, you know what? The Actors Fund, I have... You have a letter, so why don't I say what it I is? I do have a letter. The you Actors Fund is for letter. everybody in the arts, on stage, off stage, in front of the camera, behind the camera. I mean, every aspect, wig makers, ballet teachers, wedding singers, um, anybody on the crew, stage managers, I ought to say, anyone can go to the Actors Fund and ask for direct financial help. They can say, I can't pay my rent this month. Actors Fund will say, how much is it? Whatever it is, the Actors Fund will give you the money. I can't pay my health insurance. I don't even know how to get health insurance. They will help you with everything. So if you need help from the Actors Fund, if you're a professional artist, and it's a very low bar, it's not like you have to be making a ton of money. You have to basically just right. work in some aspect. And it's actually arts. lower for dancers because the Actors right. Fund knows that dancers don't make as much money as basically any other artist. Yeah, exactly. You go to actorsfund.org. They, they really can hook you up. And if you can help, you can send some donations to starsinthehouse.com. And then once you send the donations, you're going to get a receipt. Send that receipt to donations at starsinthehouse.com, and then we're going to forward it to some of our stars tonight, and they will read your name out loud just like they were in Indianapolis doing one day at a time. <laughs> By the way, they, you can also text it. Thank you, James. You can also text donations as well. As That's right. There. Text FUN2020 to 56512. And our grand total. Well, actually, before I read the yeah. grand total for today, I wanted to read uh, an email um, that was of thanks to the Actors Fund because there have been so many people that have have receive benefits from the Actors Fund. I have to say a very big, a very huge thank you to the Actors Fund for coming through big time for my husband and, and myself during these COVID-19 times. If you're in the biz, the fund grants to industry professionals, regardless of union affiliation or not, front of house or back of house. It truly saved the day for us. It, it will cover our rent and both of our insurance for the month. Wow a true lifeline and our caseworker were so helpful and respectful. So nice to speak with someone who truly understands. Thank you for that, for all that you do. So that's just one of the many people that are helped by the actors fund. And someone says right here, how about IATSE members? Absolutely. When oh, yeah. we say any, any professional, I actually said IATSE. Oh, anyone in the, any, any professional in the performing arts, we, we mean it, including yeah. it could be like, like Seth said, dance teachers, voice teachers, anywhere in the country and, and just, yeah, yeah go ahead Seth. i mean anybody and you just have to make a certain amount of money as an artist and the reason by the way we have this money that we've been given is just from these small donations people give 5 10 15 we don't have big corporate sponsors and yet since march how much have we raised for the actors fund four hundred and ten thousand nine hundred dollars wow, we hit four ten yes just this, <laughs> so just keep sending it in it really truly makes a difference as you can see just in that one person's letter so we want to we want to First off, thank you to Kerry Washington and Dan Bukatinsky for yesterday for Scandal. That was such a great reunion. And one of the By things- way, Natasha's amazing. She's doing nonstop reactions. She's I clapping, love it. Yes, yeah, so we're about up. to bring her up. It's so cute. I can love watching her. Hi, Natasha. Go, go. So, and one of the one of the highlights for, for me and Seth, I'll speak for you, um, was Norm Lewis, who was on Scandal and is also a friend and is also a co-founder of Black Theater United. And the conversation, I'm going to bring on- Natasha Vett Williams. We love Natasha Hi. from Black Theater Hi. United. Hi, Natasha. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm so did excited. you by any chance? Did you by any chance see last night with Norm? I did. I didn't watch. I didn't watch all of it yet. I'm gonna go back and watch it. But I um I'm very close with um Katie Lowe's. So because we did waitress together, and so I was watching oh. her. And then we talked today, and uh, so yeah, so yes, I did watch that. So <laughs> James and I first saw you in. In um Xanadu, have to oh, believe. No, no. Yes, you're amazing. <laughs> and now you're one of the actual founders of Black Theater United. And basically, we're having members on every single day. Tomorrow night is Lilius. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit yes, hit the E. So tell us, what is the main goal right now, Black Theater United? Because we have so many new viewers to the show tonight because there's so many one-day-at-a-time obsessed fans. We have a captive audience. Go. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 
Well, right now, uh, Black Theater United is, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, we're just an advocacy group of uh, seasoned actors, writers, directors, uh, producers, all those people coming together to, for ra to fight against racial injustice in our industry and in the world. One of the ways that we're doing that, um, our current action right now is working to uh, inform people about the census and make sure that they are have filled out the census. And you can do that three different ways, online, by phone, and by the snail mail, if you want. But there's all kinds of ways to do that. Um, and, and we've started out with our families, obviously, just making sure that you have filled out the census, the 2020 census. And then we increase that circle. This week, I've been calling friends to talk about, uh, have you submitted the 2020 census? And I, I've been really amazed and how the, the responses I'm getting. Some people know what it is. Some people think I'm talking about their eyesight. Um, with 2020, the senses, you know, touch, taste, and smell, that kind of thing. It's incredible how misinformed we are. So this is a, a big job, getting people to fill out the census because it is imperative to be counted. Um, and a lot of people just don't know what the census is. You know, Natasha, so, you know what? Should I tell you? <laughs> yes, because I was about to say yes, because I'll tell you what, I was having a conversation with someone like just a couple of hours ago mm -hmm. and she said, and she said, I filled out and she's not 18 and she's uh -huh. a really smart, educated woman. Yeah. And she was like, I filled out the census because my family said I should fill it out. But she didn't really understand yeah, what, it was. why it's so important, because it really reaches into everything about being. And then, you know, yeah. in this country, yeah. go ahead, go. That, Why okay. so important? I'm going to give you what I know, what I know, and which is which I think is, is pretty much a lot. Anyway, the census is our country's way of counting the citizens and not only citizens. We count everybody who lives in your household, whether they are. Uh, legal citizens or undocumented or visitors or whoever is living in your house as of April 1, children, not your dog, I was going to say dog cat, don't count your dog cat, but certainly count all of the people who live in your house because what that, what that number, what the government does with that number, they take it and they divide, and there's over a trillion dollars this year to be divided up among every community in the United States. And if you're not counted, you don't get a piece of that money. And that money goes toward your roads in your community, goes towards school. It goes toward um, a hospital. You know, it goes towards. It goes through so many things. It also helps decide how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives. It, the districts are decided by how many people are on those lists. It is safe to fill out. No other government agency gets that uh, gets the information from the census. There are no citizenship questions on the census. So count everybody. It is so vitally important because um, and, and as of I think I might have learned this on your show from a couple of days ago um, that only like forty percent of Americans have filled out this census thus far. Yes. Now we're already we've already extended the deadline. It's still October now, but it, it should have already expired. So 40%, that's that's nothing. And if, in case you don't understand that, that means say I'm making up a number now, but say the government will give um ten thousand dollars to each school that has a hundred families. If only 40 families mm -hmm. filled out the census, then they're not gonna get ten thousand dollars. They'll get four thousand dollars. And then that extra $6,000 that was left over that should go to your school is going to go to another community. Now, it's, it's wonderful that it will go to another community, but there's underrepresented communities all the time that don't fill out the census for whatever reason. Most of it is they don't understand it. They might right. be afraid. They don't want people in their business for whatever reason. But that's ridiculous. We have to make our voices heard. And we have to be counted because the, the disparity in our communities is, is mind blowing. And if you just are aware that if people are aware that you're there, then, then you can get a piece of some of that federally funded, funded money to help your community, to help. Um, and, first of all, help you've, been the most, you've been the most um, specific guest we've had so far for Black Theater United. I love what you said. Oh, it's been really, great. really amazingly accurate. Oops. So smart and such a high belt. My favorite person. <laughs> all right. I, <laughs> we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Ms. So, Ms. I want to sing with you so I've wanted to my whole life. I'm, I'm in so many rooms okay, now. Come on. You got to do a little listen, bit something. So many rooms now with people I admire. No, not today. No, not today. I'm not warm. I'm not warm. But I'm saying, I'm saying it, it's just incredible. So I just want to thank you guys for all you're doing for the Actors Fund too and all you're doing for the arts. It is, it is incredible. I've watched you for years. I've loved you both for years and I just want to thank you. And thank you for having uh, me. Thanks, Tasha. We're such big fans. Thank you all so right. much for being here. I'm we'll right. see you again. Start warming up. Right. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bringing up the octave. Okay. Okay, one day at a time. On to the show. So just 
I made an opening that I found. Well, I didn't make it. I found it online. That kind of shows everyone <laughs> that is on the show tonight. So let us take a gander as a fun little opening. Who is coming up? Here we go. This is it. That is one of the best theme songs ever yeah. to have been on television. I don't know how that happened. It's incredible. All right, let us talk to the man who created it all. Yeah, so we're going to do this. We're going to, there's so what much to cover. Segments? We're going to do in, in segments here. Of course, the legendary Norman Lear is going to be in all of them, but there's so much to cover. And truth be told, when we do reunions, um, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially like for a show like One Day at a Time that I grew up on that had so much influence on me. We have so many questions and i might just not be able to articulate them so let's do this a little bit at a time so i'm not too overwhelmed we're gonna bring on patricia fast palmer hi patricia hi guys how are you one of the producers of one day at a time and the legendary and the current one and that's right and the oh. current one norman lear norman. hello hi, norman <laughs> Norman, I love the American flag in back of you. It is very people for the American way. Thumbs up. It is. I'm in Vermont at a place uh, we uh, family place in. It's my family's Hyannis Park. And, <laughs> <laughs> the Yiddish Hyannis Park. So, Norman, start from the beginning. How did you decide to create this show? You, you've had so many amazing shows on the air. Why one day at a time? Well, uh, I have five daughters and a son. And at the time, uh, two daughters. Uh, and uh, talked to uh, uh, Whitney Blake and uh, Alan her, Mannings. And Alan Mannings. And, uh, and Alan Mannings, my God, how could I forget? And uh, we talked about our two kids, my two kids, and uh, and theirs. And uh, they wrote the pilot script, and uh, Patricia Palmer produced with us. But why a single mom? You're not a single woman, are you, Norman? <laughs> well, we're at, <laughs> no, but uh, I'm thinking about it. Um, there hadn't been a, uh, a divorced woman on television with children. And uh, it surprised, uh, surprising as that may seem today, it wasn't so then. There was nobody, right, Pat? That's correct. And uh, so it was very new to have a divorced woman, and two children, and uh, and and you know Patricia Palmer. I want her to talk a little bit more because nothing would have happened without her. Alan Mannings and Whitney Blake and Patricia Palmer were the stars of the show off camera. Patricia, how how did you get involved with One Day at a Time? Um. I had done a series for Norman called Hot L Baltimore. I was a script supervisor. Okay. I did Hot L Baltimore, show was canceled, and then I got a call from Norman. I've got three shows, and the one I want you to do is one day at a time. And I went, he said, it's about a, a woman newly divorced with two daughters. I went, well, okay, you know, I guess that's, that sounds all right. Not as interesting as the other two, but all right, if that's where Norman wants me, that's where I go. So that's where I went. And I spent you... nine incredible years. I have friendships that last to this day and memories that are deep in my heart. But when he says he wants you, like, you know, we're from the Broadway world. Like, you know, what does that mean? Like, what is he wanting right. you to do for one day at a time? Well, at the time for the first season, I was the script supervisor, the book, helping, you know, watching timing and everything. And then the second, from season two through season nine, I became the producer. It's hard to explain. Well, then, that 
Mm. Uh, just to interrupt to say there is always somebody on these shows who holds it all together, whatever his or her title might be. Patricia Palmer, every show she's been involved with, she is the glue that holds it all together. The cast, the crew, uh, the script, it doesn't happen without this woman. And, and Patricia, you're working on the Karma Data Time now also, right? right? Yes. Yeah, it's Yeah, Norman and I sit next to each other. We look around and go, well, look, look, at, <laughs> look at this. It's pretty amazing and I'm very blessed. Um, the new show has the heart and soul of the old, of the original. That's for sure. But it's a Latino, it's a Latino family. With a Latino Latino family, family. But it has that same, you know, heart um, with a little sauce. Patricia, <laughs> little sauce. speaking of heart and soul, you sent, I'm, I love these pictures that you sent me a few days ago. And I feel like speaking of heart and soul from the original to the new one, can you explain this oh, yeah. Mackenzie just clapped. Um, Bonnie Bonnie collected redheaded dolls they were all over the house her sisters gave that piece of pottery to me after she passed away uh, oh. she sits upstage in the new in the new show and she watches over all of us I, oh. and we feel I feel her presence all the time here, here it is in context of the current set. Here it is. Oh, wow. Here she I is. love oh. that. The first time Mackenzie saw her, she went, Bonnie. I didn't even have to explain. So. <laughs> I just love it. Now, Norman, I had Bonnie on my uh, radio show a couple of years ago. And just for the viewers out there, the one thing I do know about television is that, you know, you mm -hmm. audition low level, low level, higher, higher. Then you have to go to network, you screen test. It's a very long process. Bonnie's story was nothing like that. Can you talk about how you found Bonnie Franklin? Uh, would you uh, repeat that story, Seth? Well, <laughs> the, the I found, she existed. I saw her work. I, I, I knew she yeah, was possible, yes. and I cast her as much as I remember. But your version of casting was you basically just had a conversation with her. You didn't have her screen test or anything. You were just like, hey, do you want to do it? She was like, yeah. <laughs> Because I knew she had the same thing was true with, the, with Valerie Bertinelli, as I recall. Uh, but you go with your gut in this business. Nobody knows that better than you two. <laughs> but no one in the network was like, wait a minute. So, we want to see her also. Well, they did see her. They saw her in the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <true>. That's great. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, you know, we were talking about it was such a, you know, such a different time in the 70s, which we think was so long ago, but it was actually very advanced with the social issues your show brought up. Did you ever get any pushback from right. the network? Like, you're not allowed to blah, blah, blah. Do you recall, Pat, any real serious pushback with the, from the network? The real pushback came with Bonnie. With Bonnie. Bonnie, the standards and practices lady, would come every week. Bonnie refused to wear a bra. And they were constantly going, her nipples are showing, do something. Take her off, put band-aids on, send her back. She just, she just would not, she would not wear a bra. And that during was- the actual, During the yeah, show. Yeah, 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 yeah. put, put band-aids on those nipples. You cannot go out like <laughs> that. Okay, well, that's not quite what I was expecting. It's very <laughs> interesting. What was the story that uh, Bonnie told, Seth? Oh, no, just the story that she told was about how she was doing applause and that basically you just talked with her about one day at a time and she thought it was going to lead to a lot of reading scripts and filming. And the next thing she knew, she was actually filming the show. She said there was no long process at all. I mean, it really was magical. And you were you were right. I mean, you really knew. Do you remember finding the uh, do you remember finding Mackenzie? How did that happen? I, I'm pretty much casting pretty much happened that way. Uh, and what Bonnie may not remember is she read a half a page before I said, I'll never forget casting Carol O'Connor as Archie Bunker. You know, I flew out to California. I was starting the casting in New York. I flew out to California and um, I might have seen 20 people in New York, four of whom might have played Archie Bunker. And then I came out. Carol O'Connor walked into a room, sat opposite me at a bridge table, read 
uh, the first page. And I said, I don't have to hear any more. And that was it. He, he nailed it. Now, when an actor nails a role like Bonnie Franklin nailed uh, her character, uh, they, as a writer, you never knew what the character was. You only had a half an idea. And mm -hmm. then an actor comes in and takes it over. And now you have the character that might have passed through your head that, and, and you couldn't grab it until you had the actor. I love that. That's so interesting. And it's, a, and it's so honoring the actor as well to how they help create the character too. I love that you said that. It's great for well, the actors out yeah. there. <laughs> it doesn't exist without them. Patricia, you sent me this amazing, beautiful picture of you and Bonnie. Uh, what what was uh what was it like meeting her for the first time? Did you were you in that room with Norman when Bonnie came, or did you no. meet her after she'd been hired? No, I met Bonnie at the first table read. I it I remember it because I was the script supervisor. Right. I remember it as clear as if it was yesterday. She was wearing rolled up jeans, rolled up, and blue espadrilles. And I think when the girls come on, they may remember it too. And she was <laughs> full of life. And she had that the red hair with the bob thing and she'd whip her head around and her hair would move. She was full of life every minute. Every minute. Hmm. You know, we're talking just for one more second about the casting, Norman. I just realized Carol O'Connor came from musical theater. Bonnie Franklin mm -hmm. had won the Tony Award for applause. Sometimes there's a prejudice like, oh, theater actors don't know how to do television. They're too broad. It sounds like you welcome theater actors. Gene Stapleton also. You you like having theater actors on your shows, I, right? I, I love having theater actors. I grew up in New ha in Hartford uh, and uh, and I was allowed when I was 17 years old or so to on a Saturday to go into New York on the New York I have Hartford Railroad uh, see a matinee and come home and I was utterly in love with theater and the way I view all of the actors that we work with uh, Patricia and I uh, they're all stage actors in the, in the sense that uh, they take over the role, they inhabit it, and they make your the essence you thought of, they may come alive. <laughs> I, I love it. It's a, you've done a lot of shout outs for actors today, and I really appreciate it. We want to bring on two other actors who you may recognize from a couple of episodes. Let's see. Let's see. I think they... Let's see who's in the picture. I think both of them are in oh, this photo. There they are. <laughs> that Patricia said. So let's bring them out for real. Let's bring out Mackenzie Phillips. Julie. Hi, Mackenzie. Hi, everybody. And, and Valerie Bertinelli. Hi, Valerie. Barbara. Hi. I'm so, I've already started crying, so I don't know if I'm going to be any good here at all. Hi, Pat. Hi, Norman. Hi, Hello, Norman. Valerie. Hello, I Pat. I love you guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Val. I just lost my ear. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I miss you guys. It's so great to see you guys. You know, I was just thinking about what Norman said about Pat. And, um, you know, a script supervisor, it may, I mean, people are always like, oh, a script supervisor, whatever. That is the most challenging, difficult job anybody on a set can have they have to be watching everybody everything answer all questions have know what everybody's doing with their arms when they're doing it what they're picking up when they're picking it up when they put it down props they need to know everything and pat yes is a master at that and that's probably why she's such an amazing producer every script supervisor should be a producer I mean, they're they're they are the unsung heroes of every single episode of every single television um, series. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. That's why I, the glue they hold yeah, it glue. together. So, Mackenzie, oh yeah, put that in. <laughs> Mackenzie, what's your memory of getting the role in One Day at a Time? I remember going in and meeting with Norman, and there was a big uh, uh, oval table, and we sat at the table. And I don't remember whether I read or not, but I do remember Norman. Norman, I, I remember you telling me that my face in repose was lovely. And I remember also, 
I remember you saying something to the effect of, I hope you're aware that therapy is the backbone of the American family. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if that was like, like, you know, maybe you could use some kid, but um, I remember, I remember uh, so much. Uh, I have so many memories. Maybe they're not necessarily chronological, but they're so vivid of, uh, of being a part of the family on one day at a time and, and the, the new one day at a time, frankly. Yeah. But Mac, do you remember when you actually got the role? Were you offered the role at the oval table or did you get a phone call? I remember, and I don't know if you guys know this, but we did a pilot where Bonnie Franklin's character had one child, me, and it's actually up on YouTube. And I can't remember what it was called. I'm sure Patricia remembers. Hello, Anne. Well, Hello, well, Anne. It's on you Hello, Anne. Oh, my gosh. It, and the network saw the pilot and they were like, uh, yeah, not this one. And then Valerie became my baby sister and we had a hit. Was Pat Harrington in the first one? Yeah. Yes. Was, yeah. Yes. And Valerie, how did you get the role? Well, I'm, I was not a theater actor. I was 15 years old, just turned 15. And um, I was, I'd make maybe seven commercials at that point. And um, by the time I met Norman, I was on my fourth uh, callback. And um, I remember, was it, Gladys was our teacher, right, Mac? But the uh, casting director yes. was- uh, um, Jane Murray. Jane Murray. Mm -hmm. yes. So Jane, I remember she kept calling me back, calling me back. And um, by the time I got in to see Norman at CBS Television City down on Fairfax and Beverly, um, I, I walked in and Norman was there. And it, I, I was, even at 15 years old, I knew what a god Norman is <laughs> and was and still is. Um, and I sat down next to him and I read just a few lines and um, I don't know, Norman, if you said it in the room, but I did find out at least later that I reminded you of Maggie, your daughter. Yes. And it was that I got the role that night. And um, I don't, I didn't real, I mean, I, I remember uh, Jane um, coming and, and saying, probably everybody can leave. And then she looked at me and said, can you just stay right there for a second? And mm -hmm. my heart just flipped. I thought, did I actually get this? Yeah. Did I actually get this? And I, I was over the moon, obviously. And the first person I met um, was Mackenzie when we went to do the read through. Um, we, we ended up in the elevator together. And um, oh my God. We've, we've been real sisters ever since, whether we talk to each yeah. other or don't talk to each other, fight or don't fight or hug mm -hmm. and love each other. We are true sisters with, we're just, you know, yeah. sisters from another mister. <laughs> always in, always in, yeah, always in forever. forever. Yeah, I love you. I think I said something to you. I love you too. I think I said something to you in the elevator like, so you're going to play my kid's sister. Yes. And I was so right? intimidated I because think... I saw the posters for Rafferty and the Goldust twins were all out on the bus stops right then. And I right. had seen you all over right. the posters. And I knew about American oh Graffiti, God. and I was like, "Oh my God!" I didn't know who Bonnie was. I didn't know who Pat Harrington was, or, or David Mazur, but um, Richard Mazur. Yeah, meeting Richard Mazur. Sorry, he played David. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm one exactly. of those horrible fans, right? That get the names <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Everyone who calls me Barbara, that that's it's cool. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, exactly. Listen, look at this. Look at this really cool comment from someone from uh, a viewer. My friends and I went to every taping the first two seasons. We were 14 years old, sat next to Valerie and Bonnie's parents. They were all really nice to us. Amazing memories. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, our parents were there at every taping. Bonnie's and 14. I, yeah. Well, Va no, Valerie and I were, you know, we were school age. So we had our teacher and my Aunt Rosie was my guardian, my father's sister who kind of raised me and Valerie's mom, Nancy, and they would sit together, you know, in the rehearsal hall all day long and they'd be reading books or knitting or doing whatever. And then Valerie and I would have to go off with Gladys to our schoolroom, which was right next to the rehearsal hall. And then we'd be like, you know, come on, we, we don't want to go to school. We want to play, you know, <laughs> that's right. 
you know, Valerie was 15 when we started and I was 16. So we're six months apart. And um, it was just like magical. There was magic in that room, in that rehearsal hall. And now when when you're doing a, a four camera situation comedy, you don't start in a rehearsal hall with tape on the floor like we did. You you are all week in 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 the studio with you know, the furniture and the props and everything. So, you know, we were, we were in the rehearsal hall Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, blocking on Thursday, shooting on Friday. So like theater. we had like, yeah, it was, that's when Norman said about theater, we're performing in front of a live audience, you know, it, every episode was performed in front of a live audience and everything was blocked out. I mean, I've done a lot of theater and it's very similar to putting up a new show every week. You're putting up a new show. You're blocking it out and you're learning your cues and, you know, it's pretty cool. And we were always like one act plays. You know, we would do a 530 show and we do an eight o'clock show. We have dinner in between. That's right. They don't do that. And And now they just do one show and it takes four hours. (laughs) Right. Did things change very much in the script, Pat? Like between the two shows? Would the writers change anything? Sometimes quite a bit. And everybody had maybe a half hour to 45 minutes to learn their new lives. And they went out and did it brilliantly. It, it wasn't often, though, because our writers were kind of amazing. But it, it wasn't often. But when it did happen, it was really scary. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And would it be based on, like, the audience reaction at that first taping? Is that yeah. why changes would happen? Yes. Like what joke worked and what joke fell flat, you know. And, you know, Norman, we're an animal you- now. Right. Uh, it is, yeah. Yeah. But Norman, were, were you, uh, how heavily involved were you? Were you, did you set it up and then leave it to your babies or were you there constantly creating the show with everybody? Well, I was part of it and uh, I was, I believe, there. Yes. I, I never missed a rehearsal or a taping or, you know, I, I was quite involved. I have, I have yeah. all of my yeah. friends yeah. one writers. day at a time. Wonderful writers. And we would get, a, 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 you know, new pages or new scripts would come down. And my favorite scripts that I have from One Day at a Time, up in the right-hand corner, it has two words, Lear, Polish. Oh. So Norman would do a polish. Oh. Remember that, Val? I Honestly, would get, that, I don't remember. I, I remember other things about us writing in the sides of the scripts, with trying to, you know, get boys to like us. But I don't remember a new Lear, yes. Polish. Isn't that terrible? Lear Polish. Do you remember that, Patricia? (laughs) Norman Norman was very involved. After a few seasons, Norman turned the show over to other people who were running the show. Uh, But his heart was always with us. Yes. We were talking about the heavy... definitely there for the very first season, for the first... I think it was... um, We had 13, and then we went to 15 episodes for the first season, um, Pat. Yeah, and then uh, exactly. I, I remember Norman was there every, I mean, every single day and, and um, very helpful. I know that Norman pulled me aside one day um, midway through the season. I was so green, you guys. I was, I did maybe a couple commercials and I couldn't believe I was on set. I was learning so much every single day. And I, um, n- I started to feel like I fit in. And then Norman pulled me aside at one point and said, I can find you an acting coach. And of course, the first thing I'm thinking, since I'm so freaking sensitive, it's like, I suck. Oh my God, I'm going to get fired. But no, he was helping me. And I'll always appreciate that, Norman, always, because you made me a better actor because I went to that acting coach and I learned how to do subtext. I learned how to do all of those things along with comedy, learning from, you know, uh, Pat and along with everything Bonnie taught me, God, she was like a second mother to me and everything I, I learned from Mackenzie. I, I appreciate all of it. Every single bit. Come on. That's wonderful. But it, you were the original gift and everybody is there to help as was Mackenzie, the original yeah. gift. The gift comes at, with, with Speaking of, of, of Bonnie, Valerie, I found this, this this little bit of a clip because we're going to bring on Dr. LaPook for our medical break in, a, in just a second. But I wanted to show this clip because I just it says so much. If this is a clip, I think it is. It's when you were pretending. If you, I don't know if you remember this episode that you were on the pill, and and um, and and I love and I love Bonnie's. She was so great as a speaking of theater. 
with business. Like she knew how to work that set and the props and make it look so natural. And and it's so subtle here, but I love when you enter and then and then her reaction and, and the two of you together. I'm gonna just show it real fast. Hi mom. Barbara Jean Cooper. Bye, mom. Hold it. <laughs> Next pot, close the door. <laughs> Julie told you. Yes, thank God. And what is all this about the pill? I'm not on it. I just want the guys to think I am. If they think you are, you'd better be. <laughs> well, it's getting me a lot of dates. Oh, come on, Barbara. You know that's not the way to get dates. No, but it's a shortcut. Barbara. <laughs> just so good. She's She was amazing. She knew how to... Honestly... She knew how to take a script apart. She knew character development. She knew arcs. She knew, I learned all of that from her and I'm still a student. She was amazing, amazing. I love that. And she What's had a mouth like a truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> Which we both learned too. <laughs> I and still I do. love that about her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me too. When would it come out? Would you get angry or would you just be sassy? I never saw Bonnie angry. I, I never saw her, saw her intense. angry either. No, mm -hmm. she was intense and she was direct and she mm. was sure of what she was about to tell you that she was right and she always was right. Wow. But she was also very open to someone else's opinion and what they had to say. Wow. Wow, what a mom. I you love it. Oh, she's fabulous. Mom. <laughs> she, yeah. She, so was made, she, we would come in for a table read on Monday morning. And she'd already, like, she'd be like, no, this is not how it's supposed to be. And she'd start helping to rework it. And she was very, she was like a bulldozer, a lovely, wonderful, brilliant bulldozer who, who had the courage of her convictions and what she thought the show would be. And I also really appreciated how they let me and Val say, you know, teenagers don't really say that. That's not the way teenagers really talk. Now, because, you know, some of our writers, you know, were older men and they, they had the comedy thing, but they were using the wrong verbiage and we were allowed to sort of move it around to make it funny and make it work for us. That's I, re I yeah. remember one episode in particular, and Mac, you might remember this too, is um, there was an episode about um, drinking and we had a bunch of boys over to the apartment and they were all drinking. And it was a lighthearted, very funny episode. Oh, and, oh, yeah. you know, and it just ended in a way that didn't really take anyone to task for oh. their drinking. So through the week, it, it got more and more serious, but it, it, it is oh. exactly what Norman's shows do so well, is yeah. take a subject that is very uncomfortable and we need to learn something from, and we need a moral about it. Um, mm -hmm. And and give make it funny, and and she was adamant about that episode not ending the way it did, and it did end with a drunk driving incident and somebody I believe dying. Pat, am I wrong? Yep, that's right. Wow. Yeah. So and it did not start off that way, but Bonnie was like, no, if you're going to talk about drinking and teenagers, make it have some some um, gravitas behind it. Wow. Wow. Okay, on yeah. that note, we're going to bring in Dr. LaPook, and then we're going to bring back all of you, plus Michael Lembeck and Glenn Scarpelli. Yes. So hold on for a minute. We'll see you in a little bit. Yeah. Mr. Lear, Mac, Pat. You've got Dr. John Lear LaPook. <laughs> Under the same roof in a different room, Dr. LaPook. <laughs> Guys. Wow, that was fun. Oh I mean, God. Norman's like a father-in-law to me. Oh, wait. <laughs> He is. I won the father-in-law sweepstakes. What was your What was your audition like for <laughs> for son-in-law? Amazing, you know. I got really nervous, and he walked me around the block and said, uh, "What are your intentions, young man?" And <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was married. Uh, you know, it worked, John. I, you know, I have a I have a confession uh, yeah. right now. The uh, you know when you when we had had that call on March sixteenth when we started this whole thing together. And you said, I'll, I'll be the medical correspondent for Stars in the House. I was secretly wishing the whole time that you would be the in so that we would have a one day at a time reunion. I see. It was I, all leading to today. And so I don't you're fired. at all. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> only kidding. No, oh. but it's been, it, but it, I, but I have been, I've been, I have been hoping like how cool it would be. And then when you said that Norman was going to be, you were going to have some time together in Vermont. I was like, okay, this is the moment. And yeah. then Mac had just been on the show with 
Greece, and it all just fell into place. And here we are. So, what what is the, what are the updates? Not to bring us down, but are uh... no, I'm not, not going to bring you down. And I, the last thing I want to say about Norman is I've had yeah. a, imagine having a master class at the feet of Norman Lear for for 37 years, which is what I've had. Yeah, 37 years. Uh, pretty good. And I have to say, he's helped me not only as a as a human being, but as a physician. No kidding. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've picked up from him and his daughter, Kate, somebody I'm quite <laughs> fond of. Uh, anyway, we'll move away from that. I said that all because, you know, I want breakfast tomorrow and, you know, we are up here in Vermont. Um, I'll just because we, we, we all want to get back to all to uh, not all the family. It is no. all the family here to one day at a time. Um, remember what masks were in April. Should we wear them? And it took months and months and months. And finally, we, uh, it's pr it's proven they help, and everybody finally maybe is starting to come on board. That's where we are with ventilation right now and aerosols. So you saw in today's New York Times, maybe there was a wonderful uh, article about it. Air, the, the virus can be spread through the air. We don't know to what extent. We don't know exactly the percentages of it. But we do know that if you're indoors and the ventilation isn't good enough, the, the virus can go farther than the six feet the aerosols can go across the room and that that shouldn't scare people it should just be an opportunity to fix it which means better ventilation put the uv filters maybe in the in the air duct system increase the air exchange into it from the outside to the inside uh, put air filters in and then of course do all the other stuff that we've been talking about but if you're going to think about going back to school which is on everybody's mind right now one everybody's got to wear a mask i was talking about this with somebody yesterday if you're thinking about going indoors and in the school and you're not wearing a mask, you're, you're looking for trouble. Two, it's got, it can't be hugely spread in the area where you're going. So, you know, if it's more than a 10% positivity rate in your, in your PCR testing, you know, that's not a place. You don't want to be starting to open up in an area where it's spreading wildly. And then you have to be thinking about all the other stuff, distancing, who's vulnerable, worried about the teachers. And all that. But if you do all that, and if we get the testing up and we do the contact tracing and people do everything they're supposed to, we're in the beginning of August almost. We could, if we really as a country mobilize, we could get so much more safely back to business, to school, to everything, if we all rode in the same direction. Okay, go back to uh, my father in law and uh, one day at a time. All <laughs> right. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Um, all right. All so, right. Let's bring bring them all out, Seth. So we've got the fabulous Norman, his sidekick. We've got Hi, Pat. his <laughs> TV daughter, his <laughs> other TV daughter. <laughs> then we have the man who stole one of them away, Mr. <laughs> Michael. Why the hell are you getting up, Michael? I could see you moving. What are you doing, Michael Lem? Lembeck? He, he's getting ready. Focus on the camera. Michael Lembeck. <laughs> Lembeck! <laughs> Laura, hi, Michael. You're Michael. Oh, hi, Val. Hello, Norman. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to oh see my you. God, this is so cool. <laughs> and don't forget, sort of your brother, best friend, sidekick, everything, Mr. Glenn Scarpelli. There he is. Hi, hi Glenn. Glenn. Yay. Hey, you guys. Hi. Good to see you, so wonderful to, It's so wonderful to see all of you. This just makes my heart feel so happy, you guys. <laughs> uh, everyone, my God, the comments we're getting. Your show meant so much to so many different people. Let's 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 go back to the question we keep asking. Glenn Scarpelli, how did you get the fabulous role? Well, I got one day at a time thanks to my sister Valerie Bertinelli. Really. She <laughs> me? it is. Yes, Val, you got me the audition. You came to see me in Richard the Third on Broadway with Al Pacino. With Al Pacino. Recall. Yes. And when Bon was looking, when you guys started looking for Alex, Bonnie said to you, Valerie, I really want a kid with theater credits. And you thought of me. Are you kidding me? No, that's really, that is what, that is what happened. And I got a phone call at that point. Norman was chairman of the board. It was still tandem tat at the time. And Norman was chairman of the board. And Al Burton, who was one of the guys that ran your company, Norman. I remember Al, he got me tickets to see Elton John at the Troubadour. <laughs> <laughs> when he I was rocked. 15. Oh, he rocked. 
I love and, and then I auditioned in New York and then flew out to LA and I auditioned for Bond and and they showed the tape to Norman and you were there, Valerie. And uh, I got the part that day and by Monday I was on the set and I never went back to New York for all four years of high school. Oh my God. I, it was I so didn't realize that. I, I just, I thought, because I always, I remember seeing you in Richard III because uh, it was amazing and you were amazing. But I thought Thank you. It, through the years, I thought that I had seen you after you had gotten the role and I went to go see you, but I was just there. Yes. <laughs> Yes, okay. and you actually you actually said to me as we were leaving the court theater on 48th Street, that's where we did Richard III, you said to oh. me, Glenn, if there's anything I could ever do for you, you just let me know. And you did well, something for me. you did it all, me. Glenn. You did it all. I, I didn't get Thank you the part. You got, your, you got yourself the part. <laughs> Thank you. And if I just say one more thing, I went to dinner with Bond two days after she shot her um, guest star on Hot in Cleveland. And she just raved that Val, she was going off about how proud she was of you and how you really took that example that she felt she gave to run that show. And all those lessons that, that, that she taught you, you applied when you did hot. And she was just like, just waxing poetic. And I don't know if I've ever shared that with you, but I have to share that with you tonight. Thank you. Thanks for making me cry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and speaking of Hot in Cleveland, do you realize that Michael Lembeck, he is the director of the pilot of Hot in Cleveland. He directs I mean, everything. Horrible. And Mackenzie was on Hot in Cleveland. It's like such a small world. Oh my God! Well, that means we're gonna. Have, you know what? That means we're gonna have to have a Hot in Cleveland reunion. Cleveland. Michael, what, uh, yes. Norman, yes, all those James. years ago, were you in a little off-Broadway show called Two on the Isle? No. No. But if I was, I'm sure I would be very good in it. I did an off-Broadway yes. musical, musical called Angry Housewives. Yes. I remember that. At Manetta Lane Theater. At the Manetta Lane Theater. Yeah. Yeah. And you also did a... That's right. The first national tour in uh, 72 and 73. That's right. Wow. So how did you how did you get the gig? So Norman saw you in Two on the Isle and or how did you <laughs> um, actually it, it was a, it was one of your usual gather the normal suspects and bring them in. It's always me and John Rubenstein. It's always the same ten guys, and uh, and we all came in and read the first time we read for writers. I think maybe Palmer and Janie. Then there was a callback, and the, and the callback was for the Kurgo sisters. That's right. And Bonnie and Val, yeah. and I had just done a pilot of The Goodbye Girl, and they seemed to like what I did. And we talked about. I said, if I get called back, should I? What I, the beard? Blah blah blah. And both Bonnie and Val said, keep the beard. <laughs> and then sometime after that, there was the final call back, and that was like at nine a.m. on a Monday morning in Norman's office, and all of you guys were there, <laughs> and I was me and one other person uh, came in to read. And then you made me sit out in the lobby for about 40 minutes. And then you brought me back in and they said, okay, you have the part, go down to rehearsal. <laughs> and, wow. And I walked in on Monday and uh, the same day I auditioned and started rehearsing. And, and I will tell you that the thing I take away from that experience with Bonnie is that Bonnie never met anybody for the first time. The minute you walked into wherever she was, mm. you felt cared for, invested in, wanted somebody wanted you to maximize whatever it is that you were trying to succeed at. That's what she did. You felt like you were in her living room. I never saw anybody take in visitors as we had every week as guests and make them feel so comfortable. And I took that lesson with me during my 30 years or so now of directing. It's the first thing I think of. Is I'm going to take with me for the was. next 30 years. You're alarming. She never met anybody for the first time. That's yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's her greatest. I love it. For me, my experience of her, that's her greatest quality. Yeah. So, Glenn, you were the youngest on the show. You had you had a lot of stuff with Michael. What was it like working with Michael? What was he like? Michael, oh don't my listen. Gosh. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, Michael, <laughs> Michael different. Boyd Gaines and Pat Harrington. Oh my gosh. Talk about an incredible influence on a young teenager's life. 
You know, I'm working with the, the funniest people in show business, Valerie Bertinelli, Mackenzie Phillips, Pat Harrington, Michael Lembeck. You know, we did with this one episode, Michael, if you recall, where you played my my uh, baseball coach. Yeah, and, I, I, have, and, I have a still from it. And you gave it to me at oh. Harrington's funeral. Right. I was so touched by that, Michael. Honestly, I my home burned to the ground. I lost listen, all my listen, pictures. Listen, as, and, as the girls were saying and, and everybody is saying it, it's my fondest experience in terms of the amount of laughter every day, the amount of love in that room every day, the fact that we were captives in that rehearsal hall lifeboat. And in a couple of days, we got <laughs> off the tape and into the set. What went on in that, in that rehearsal hall all day, I don't know how we got anything done. But and everybody knew how. Huh? Remember at lunchtime playing hearts or spades? Oh, That's sure. That's where we I learned play. all my swear words. <laughs> <laughs> with with Jacobucci? Yes, you <laughs> do. Yeah. Jacobucci. Alan Rafkin. Alan Rafkin, yes. Yeah, I'm playing cards at, at, at lunchtime with my Jacobucci. Yeah. Michael, I got to tell you, Michael, Jacobucci on the crawl. Jacobucci on the crawl. <laughs> The timing that you asked me about that, the timing I learned from oh Michael Lembeck is absolutely incredible. And Harrington was so generous, right? I mean, like he would, he at one point gave me shtick to do. He wasn't even in the scene. Yeah. In fact, he cut himself, I think, out of the scene because sometimes he would do that. He goes, I don't think I'm really needed in this scene. <laughs> and and he gave me some shtick and it was a scene with Valerie actually. And it just worked, worked over so well. And I left the stage and he picked me up and he spun me around and he was like, you did so good. You yeah. know, because <laughs> that's the kind of love that everybody had for each other. Yeah, it was like that every day, every day. Yeah, I have a clip of um of uh Pat Harrington. He's so hilarious <laughs> from this the is, blooper reel, right? Yeah, from a blooper reel. This is uh, the three of you. Very funny. It is all right for a man to live with a woman, but it is not all right for a woman to live with a man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Schneider is crazy. All right, Julie, <laughs> let's be frank. <laughs> you find something wrong with that speech? Did you find something out of order with that speech? Yeah, Did no. I not follow my instructions to the T? Was I not told to get off on a good laugh? Did I not get off on a good laugh? Oh, that's so great. That's so, great. so great. You know, oh, Jeff, Jeff, me and Boyd and Harrington formed a jazz trio called the, the Big Guy Trio. And at lunch, Pat would play piano, I would play guitar, Beth would play bass, and we wound up playing Sweet Georgia Brown on the Merv Griffin show. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and somewhere wow. towards the end, Harrington dropped two bars. And he looks at us like, what is the matter with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much singing on the show. Michael, you sound amazing on this. You and Max sing together, and you're so adorable in this. Look how much music there was on the show constantly. Picture a little love nest Down where the roses cling Picture the same sweet love nest That's what the years will bring Oh my God! Oh, got I it. That. Wow. <laughs> wow! I remember that. Oh my God. Wow! Wow! This I someone has to go run and get a picture really quick. Yeah. Okay, I, go. I look, Laura. Look at this. Can you see this? Oh. Oh, my Mac. God. oh yes. I found it in a box today. Oh. Wow! Wow! So so I love it. Oh. This is I love about? how Lem calls me Laura. Oh, me too. So I have it right there. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I love it. You know what? Norman's wow. writers would write us a ridiculous premise every once a year so we could all sing and do shtick. 
in a it for it performed for people. It had no purpose yeah. other than let him sing. Yeah, it was the old people's home that you went to. Yeah, God, those shows were fun. Those were someone has a really you were good my question. On and Bob, do you remember that oh. one? Yep. I wanted to mention Dick Sensenhouse and Cary Grant. They were, they were yeah. writing team. They wrote a lot right. of it. Alan Rafkin was a great director, and yeah, I, there, there was an awful lot of talent about on this show for those nine nine years. That's a long time. A long time. James, James, what Norman didn't tell you about hiring yeah. Bonnie is that CBS said no, and Norman said that I'm taking my show back. And they wow. backed off, but he won't tell you that. <laughs> Wait, why did they say they, no? My God. They thought she was too young to be the. Oh, the that's mom. right! I forgot that. Yeah, they, of two daughters. Yeah, and he stood his ground, and he wins. Yes, he does, and time shows that he wins. Hey, someone had a really good question. Norman always wins. Chris, Chris was, there was there much, much ad lib on the show, on the show? Or, or did you just do straightly the script? Like, did you add anything while you were yeah, filming? The ad libbing came in the course of rehearsal. The actors lent a lot to right. each of the scripts. But when they were, when the camera rolled and the lights were on, and they were on, on target, on the lines. I think, the, I think, I mean, you guys tell me if you agree, but I think the biggest ad libber was probably Nanette. She would just, <laughs> during rehearsal, she just would leave the script and oh, hey, whatever. God, she was yeah. funny. She was the grandma of the set. She was our grandma. One. Hey, Glenn, would you talk about would you talk about your your episode with Bonnie where uh -oh. you had that? Oh, can you not hear us? Can you hear me? Uh oh, Glenn, no. Sign for him. Oh, no. Go out and then come back. We gotta kick him out. Are you when talking about <laughs> me? Yes. Yeah. Just, just I'm gonna leave. I'll yeah, be right yeah. back. Okay, come back. Glenn knows the, the drill. Yeah, we do know the drill. <laughs> so let me talk then to Mackenzie and Valerie. Yeah, talking about the screen. The one episode I remember so clearly is when you guys were Kiki, Dean, Elton, John. Did you <laughs> ask to do that? I love that episode. Oh. How did that happen? Go, Mac. Valerie's a huge Elton John fan. Yeah. I thought I was going to marry him when I was 13. <laughs> oh, <laughs> little did you know. <laughs> he did get married. I don't care. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I still have the boots that I wore. I wish I still had the jacket. Um, I have the boots in my office. I don't want to leave again because I just lost connection. So. Um, oh yeah, don't do that. No, I won't do that again. Um, but I was nervous as all get out because these are all theater trained people. These are all they all have musical ability. I sing in my shower. I sing in the car. That's it. So this was scary for me. But because it was Elton John, I I just I was just gonna have fun. But, but Val, did it come about because the writers knew how much you loved yeah. Elton John? They did, yeah. I mean, I had an Elton John poster mm -hmm. in my room when you fall, when you saw Barbara's room for the first time. Oh, so, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's I loved it's him. And I actually got, again, I want to go get the picture, but Elton John <laughs> sent me um, a, a signed picture after the episode aired. Someone showed it to him, and he signed a picture to me, and I still have it to this day. I was 16 years old. And it, it was, I I remember being in my bedroom, my mom saying, you got a delivery because you didn't think of 1976 guys. It was very strange back then. It was very different. But um, yeah. yeah, I saw the, I unwrapped it and it was a picture from Elton and I thought I was going to just die. Mm -hmm. Of course. It. it was so clear. I mean, it, I just found it. it was so clear in my memory. I remember it so oh my much gosh. when I was a kid. Hold on here. I hear the two of you. A little bit. <laughs> I, I thought I was getting so into character, I actually cut sideburns into my hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, so but it's very intimidating because everybody sang. Obviously, you know, Bonnie was nominated for a Tony for applause. and you She know, won a she Tony. An amazing voice. She won a Tony, sorry. Um, she And Mackenzie obviously has a beautiful singing voice. All of these guys right. have 
amazing voices and you know <laughs> here I am so it was it was a lot of fun for me but it was really scary Glenn can you hear us now by the way yes I can thank you okay, good. I love <laughs> that dress did you keep it Mac Hold on. I can't hear Time you delay. now. Yes, could you keep no, the they wouldn't let me have it. I think it was like a very expensive dress and they had to give it back. Ah, oh, bummer. To who? Kiki D? Oh, that's probably why I no. get the jacket back too. I but wanted to, but I Whoa, couldn't. Whoa, Michael Lambeck. It was like super fancy. Hold oh on. Oh my God, Michael, you're a heartthrob. Put that back up. Come on, Lambeck. Oh, Come on. Wait, <laughs> how did you tease your hair like Elvira? <laughs> well, in the 70s, so my friend. What did you say, Val? He doesn't have to. You have to see how thick it is? That's oh, true. It's, it's natural. Yeah. I've got the Jufro. So wait, Glenn Scarpelli, <laughs> can you please tell the story about that amazing episode where you, you basically acted out and Bonnie had to hit you and how that came to be? Oh, yes. And I know Patricia will remember this very, very clearly, too, that we decided early in the week that Bonnie was actually going to slap me in the episode. And that was kind of a really big deal for Bonnie. Because, I mean, you know, slapping a kid is a pretty big deal. And um, the morning that we shot that show, Bon called and called my parents and said, can I drive Glenn to work? Because I just want him to spend extra time today because I just want him to know I love him. And I don't want him to know, feel anything but love from me wow. today. Because when we get to tonight, you know, it's going to be a big deal for her. And she came and picked me up at, from work. We had a great talk. We had a wonderful time. And and that scene just is so important to me because I, I feel it was the moment that Alex really got embedded in the cast that gave me a chance to really, you know, show some wares. How old were you? I was 14. I was 14 when I started the show. I was 14 through 18 on the show. And, um, you know, I'm an only child. And I really had two sisters that I adopted in my heart. I feel that way about you guys. And Uncle Norman and my brother Michael. You know, we were so much more than a TV family. And when Mackenzie came back on the show, because I came on the show, of course, when Mac wasn't on the show at first. And when Mac came back, there was such a beautiful bond. And I was so nervous to meet her because I'm like, is she going to like me? I mean, like, what's that all about? And she just came running up to me in the rehearsal and said, you do such a great job on the show. And you know, that's just the kind of love that was on that set. I fell in love with you the, the day I met you. Aww, I fell thanks, a little man. bit in love with you the day I met you. And I've been in love with you ever since. <laughs> I, I mean, feel you know that love. way. You know what I'm talking about. I get it. I get it. You know, you're you're I, safe. I'm a gay man. Is, is Glenn speaks to Bonnie's character so eloquently because um, Bonnie was that person that wanted to make sure that she did everything um, so that everybody was okay with it. She, I remember her once calling my mother because I was getting very close to Bonnie and at an age, imagine a 15, 16, 17 year old, you rebel against your mother, or at least I did as, as a teenage girl. And um, Bonnie saw that happening and took me under her wing, but also wanted to make sure that my mother wasn't offended or scared that she was losing her daughter. Bonnie oh, called wow. my mother and said, I just want you to know that I'm here for you as much as I'm here for Valerie. And I just want you to know that I'm just, I'm listening to her and I'm, I'm being a friend to her. Wow. I'm not her mother. You're her mother. She really put my mom at ease. And I found this out years, years, maybe even decades later. But wow. um, that speaks to her character. Bonnie was uh, a true mensch. Wow. A true here's mensch. That. And Harring Harrington, too. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. Harrington. Uh, no, here's, here's that incredible scene where you and Bonnie had to have that argument. It's really impactful. Mother and I. Well, just don't say that, okay? There is no my father in you. There's my father in me and my father in my mom. You're out of it. I care about you. I care about your father. Nobody asked you to. He did. He did not. Just butt out of our life. Alex. Please be kidding, huh? Kidding? You think I'm kidding? Well, let me tell you something. I hate this building and I hate this new apartment that you decorated. I was being helpful. You were butting in. That's not true. Yes, it no, is. It's you were not. butting in, taking over. Look, Alex, you are being unfair. You are being totally unfair. You're acting like a brat, a spoiled, rotten, obnoxious brat. And maybe I damn well better take over because it doesn't look like your mother or father are doing a very good job. I hate you. Alex, I hate you. Alex! I hate you. And if you were such a great mother, how come your kids dropped out of school and ran away, huh? Alex! Oh, hey. Be my love. 
Wow. 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 That was hard for her. That wow. was really hard for her. Mm -hmm. Wow. But mm. but that's that's what made that show great. Yeah. We all had these moments. I don't know if I've ever had a character that cried so much on a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> That's Norman Lear special, that's for sure. <laughs> Did Bonnie? It's everybody involved in the show. Did Bonnie, Bonnie ever slap was, you? That, Bonnie know. was a noble woman and a strong and convicted. Uh, uh, her convictions were her strength. And, uh, but, but she listened. She was also somebody, as you remember, Patricia, she could change her mind and she, mm -hmm. she listened. She was as strong as she could be, but she listened also and changed her mind. Yeah. Now, were you ever slapped by Bonnie? I honestly don't remember. Um, uh, the, the I think you would have remembered. I was. I probably would have remembered. I mean, we went through. A, you were back? Mac, you were? Yeah, oh, she slapped me in the older, the older man with, uh, with Jim Hutton. Yeah, she smacked me in the face. Yeah, that's right. Remember that, Patricia? Yes, I do. Did you ever have okay. to worry about so like, good. was the network ever worried about any kind of physical violence? Like, did they have to monitor it, no. or it was just no. it was the seventies? No, they were only ever worried about Bonnie's nipples. <clears throat> it made no sense. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Val, what about you? You were yeah. a teenager. You weren't like a twenty-five-year-old. Talking about teenage problems, you were a teenager. Were you ever hmm. mortified talking about the stuff on TV, like, you know, being on the pill and whatever? Were you never were scared your friends were going to make fun of you for the private stuff you were talking about? No, I was only ever mortified if I had to kiss somebody. And I never ever, I never ever wanted to kiss anybody, unless I had You're a crush so on them. I mean, of course, <laughs> I wanted to kiss Mark Hamill, but he didn't. He wasn't there on the show for for that. He was. Uh, he was. Schneider's nephew, which was a brilliant episode, and um, there were every guy that would come yeah. on the show. Mac and I would be like, "He's mine! No, he's mine! No, he's mine!" She would win every single time, except for Scott Columbi. She would get to go out with every single one of them. <laughs> and if I was only oh, out, I would have fought you for them too. Came along. I was going to say, Glenn, yeah. <laughs> By the way, Val, we have one. You have, for all your I'm shy about singing, you sang up a storm. Watch this sexy number. Word. You is the sexy, sensuous, sultry, Miss Cuddles Cooper. The minute you walked in the joint. Oh, go ahead, Seth. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I want you to take over. You still got it. Oh, God. Can we just can we go back to Mackenzie singing, please? Because she's got such a beautiful voice. I know. Well, she, she she signed off in order to yeah. give the to cede the floor to you, Val. But yeah. I think oh, she's trying God, to get back on right here. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Yes, Mac Mackenzie, sure. please start singing. Please take over. Cover, please. <laughs> She's back. So wait, so everyone keeps asking what, what your favorite episodes were. Mackenzie, what was your favorite episode? Okay. Bonnie, Valerie, and I get snowed in in a cabin in the woods. <gasps> and we end up, uh, we're snowed in and we end up sort of having this sort of beautiful, you know, relationship where we're all freezing and we're all bundled up and it's cold and we're in a fold out bed and we start talking about boys and Valerie's character, uh, Valerie says, so something about sex. And I'm going, oh, no, it's nothing. You know, she's like, what, what is sex like? And I'm like, oh, it's really good. And then I'm like, oh, no, it was, <laughs> it was just very lovely and very sweet. And, and I think it really showed the relationship that the three women had as people. It really translated into the characters, especially for me in that particular episode. That was a good one. We were all cuddled. It was one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite episodes. Yeah. Me too. Lenbeck, what about you? Um, I never thought about that. I guess it's a tie. 
Um, there was so much pressure in my first two episodes. It was a two-parter in which Laura's character is supposed to uh, be marrying somebody else. She brings home and winds up marrying me. And that was the end of the second of the two-parter. And my anxiety over the reaction of the audience when it was revealed that she's standing next to me and not the other guy was <laughs> overwhelming. And then when they cheered, I nearly fainted. Um, and that's a very vivid memory. And the other one would be the Dear John episode, which was so hard and we kept postponing because we needed to find a way for Laura's character to write me a note that made it okay for her to leave while I took care of the child. And it was just really hard to get right. And when we did it, um, it was a really emotional experience and, and very, very satisfying. Mm. So that stays with me forever, that one. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. And Valerie, what about you? I don't know why I keep going back to the broken nose episode, but Barbara breaks her nose at one point, and um, I just felt like I finally got to um, show what I've learned through the years of, of being on the show and showing all of the points that I was given from Norman, from Mac, from, you know, uh, Bonnie and, and Pat, and I was able to, for the first time in my um actual acting like cry on camera and it was it was a, a thing for me because crying has always been hard for me in front of people you would never know it now because that's all i ever do is cry but um it was really hard back then because i was very about holding my emotions and and mm. not letting anybody see me vulnerable so um i remember that episode feeling very fulfilling that i fa i finally felt like a real actor when I had done that show, I felt like I really accomplished mm. something. <clears throat> Love it. And Norman, do you have a favorite episode? Every one of them is a favorite. Episode. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, I uh, as hard as we work with in in a writer's room at a writer's table, uh, that all vanished when we came into a rehearsal. <clears throat> so, uh, this group, these two young women, and Bonnie and and Pat inhabiting those characters. I mean, it was a thrill of thrills. I, I, I just remember a good time all, every step of the way and people who really got along. You know, Norman, we also lived in a very privileged time in terms of how the shows were written and, and rehearsed. Mm -hmm. And we had two scripts on Monday. Mm -hmm. We had this week's script and then we read next week's script Mm -hmm. So while we were rehearsing mm -hmm. this week's script, they could get ready for the table read next week's script. And that mm -hmm. I've never experienced that since then. And the other mm -hmm. thing was there never. was no there was no mandate that there had to be 20 scenes or that there had to be a first act, and a second act, and a third act. We sometimes had 20 paid scenes, 15 paid scenes. Yeah. I there's a scene I love there, Bonnie and I yeah. sit on the couch. It's like 12 pages. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody dares to do that anymore. So for us, it was just a privilege and talk about being in a theatrical experience. That would be one. That would be like doing the first act. That's one scene. Second act, that's another scene. It was a glorious time for us. It really was. Yeah. Uh, I love hearing it. It was, it was for us as uh, writers and producers also. We had a great, great time. And, uh, you know, the play was the thing. Pat, you, yeah. you were very well aware of that. Norman, yeah. Norman, used, Norman used to say, as we started, let's read the play. <laughs> never called mm -hmm. it a script. Yes. Yeah. Mac, it would, I think we'd be a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, remiss if, since we're here for the Actors Fund, I know that when you were here before with Glenn a couple of months ago, you talked about why the Actors Fund was important. Do you mind talking about that for a, for a minute or two? Yes, because thank you for the donations. Yes, thank you for the donations coming in, but. Why was the why was Me? the actors fund important to you? Yes, you, Mac. Yeah. Oh, my God! Uh, I mean, uh, I you know I've had a lot of ups and downs in my career and in my personal life, as e certainly everybody on this screen knows, and probably most people out there watching. And there was a time where I couldn't pay my bills, and I was able to access funds through the actors fund to help me pay my my rent. 
uh, and my health insurance and buy groceries. And it really kept me afloat uh, during a very, very uh, dark and scarce time. So it, it really does. And it's not just actors. I mean, you know, the guy who carries the cables around, the guy with the boom mic, the guy behind the camera, you know, the, the craft service lady, you know, anybody can uh, apply for funds from the Actors Fund. And it, it, it does uh, like a huge mitzvah, especially during the time of COVID, where actors and artists and, and crew members are struggling to put food on the table. Uh, so donating to the Actors Fund is really a beautiful thing to do because we all benefit from the work that uh, actors and actresses and crew members do. We get to watch it and it entertains us in our homes um, and they have nowhere to go. They're not considered essential. I'm lucky I work in a, a drug and alcohol treatment center and I'm considered an essential worker. So I'm still gainfully employed. But were I were I relying on money from acting uh, to um you know, pay my mortgage and the house I've been in for 20 years and so on and so forth, I would be, in, I might be in some serious trouble and I might have to go back to the actor's fund, but luckily I shifted gears and I'm cool, but a lot of people aren't in that position. Yeah. You know, we had, they, they, on Tuesday, they, they are remarkable. We, we, but it's interesting you say that about the essential workers, because of course, I think all of us, we believe that the arts are essential and, uh, and we had on right. Tuesday, we had a, 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 a very long episode uh, for in conjunction with Americans for the Arts and Theater Communications Group. And really, and we and for anyone watching, go to starsinthehouse.com and there is an action alert on our website. And if you click that, it's really easy, Americans for the Arts, um, to go ahead and click that and you to write to your representative and your senator our senators and to tell them to include the performing arts in the next stimulus bill, which is going to come at any yes, time and help the economy to it. it really, it, yes, it, because essentially, I mean, we are artists are essential and we had people from theaters all over the country that were on saying every theater and performing arts center in the country has a whole economic e ecosystem around them. The restaurants, the stores, the parking the par even the parking garages, they're all there and essential. So please, mm -hmm. please, please, starsinthehouse.com, Americans for the Arts, will, they'll take you right to their website. Norman Lear, you of all people, I, I would love to hear you tell, tell us why the arts are essential. Why the arts are essential? Uh, we learn a lot about ourselves through the arts. Uh, I don't know, I, the, the, the thing I've enjoyed hearing the most from people I've met who know something about what I've been responsible for, what I've worked on, what I enjoyed most is when people tell me uh, the show ended and then they and their parents talk for two hours or the next morning at the water cooler. The water cooler was a big thing in the 70s because people came to work the next day and around the water cooler they talked about the show they had seen. And to think that something we collectively did together mattered to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of people and that made their lives a little bit better because they learned something about their own human nature or they learned it in the discussion that followed because it was triggered by what they had seen. Uh, you know, to be a part of that and working with all of these people is uh, how does anybody get more fortunate? We can't let it die. We can't let the arts die. And they will in a lot of ways, unless we are getting some relief. Mm -hmm. It's so you donate it starts in the house and you also go there for the action alert. Absolutely. It's the same website for the action alert. May okay. I say something? Yeah, Valerie, yes, go. Please. Oh. Well, everything just froze. Oh, you froze, Valerie. Uh anybody else freeze? Did Norman freeze? No. But you look no. beautiful, Valerie, all frozen. <laughs> Wow, She's so frozen. pretty anyway. I know, right? Anyway, okay. I, I have got my kids here and need to return to them before the evening ends. Yes, sir. Okay, so you leave, Mr. Norman. Okay, Lear. Norman. Uh, I'm going to stay here. 
Before Norman goes, he just turned 98. Oh, just turned 98. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. Happy you. birthday, Norman. Thank you, darling. Thank Happy you all. Birthday. Happy birthday, Norman. Hi, Norman. Happy birthday. Love you, Norman. Love you, love you too. Love you three. <laughs> okay, so he's going to leave. I want to talk. But Val, we want to hear what you were going to say. Norman yes. said he had to go, oh. but we, we do want to hear what Come you had on. to say. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to get back. I just wanted to make a, a point about the arts and how it has. Um, help the progression of communities across the country and maybe even in the, obviously in the world that um, before we did one day at a time, you didn't see a divorced woman with children on television. So all of a sudden a family that watched this that was divorced felt like they weren't alone. We didn't see many um, LGBTQ characters on television before maybe, I mean, yes, before Will and Grace, but Will and Grace made it acceptable um, and, and until you see, you know, when we saw all of the black community, um, welcomed <clears> on <throat> television with whether with the Jeffersons or, uh, yes. good times good or time. whatever it was, it, it like, you're able to see yourself on television. You're able to see yourself and feel not so alone in the world and, and to hear stories that sound familiar to you and make you feel not alone in the world. And I think that's, what's so important about the arts is that it reflects a society and it also moves a society and a community forward in in how we all need to behave and be. Oh, oh, oh. So the frozen. <laughs> it was so, so good. beautiful, though. That was so I know. good. Yeah. Previously, uh, stars in the house. So oh, no, she's there. She's there. She's there. She's there. She's there. Yes, we heard. We heard everything you said, Val. I don't know where it ended, but um, I'm just saying that the arts need, we need the arts to help um, reflect ourselves and to move, move a community even further into acceptance of all people. Absolutely. I, I, love I don't that. believe well that said, there's races. I don't, I don't believe in the myth of race. We are all one. We are the human being. We are the human race. So um, I want us to feel closer to that as being all one, one race. I love it. Um, uh -huh. I and just before we go, it is really an honor to be uh, here with with an a, actual sex symbol. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Look at that! Yeah. Oh, baby. oh baby! Oh my God, Glenn! That's, that's fantastic! What a this great way to end the show! <laughs> you guys, it was so great. I'll thank you, all of you, so that much. Was so fun. What a what a so great fun. evening! All right, so thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. You made TV history. Thank yes, you, you did. All right, Seth, you gonna play Thanks, us everybody. out? Love you. Bye, Val. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye, Laura. Love you guys. Love, Love you. you.